Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited that so many of you could join us today for On Asexuality, Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex. I'm Alex Elliott, the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Angela Chen and Sabrina Imbler, and then we'll get right to the conversation. Sabrina Imbler is a science journalist and essayist based in Brooklyn. Her work has appeared in Atlas Obscura, Audubon, Scientific American, and Grist. She is the recipient of fellowships from the Asian American Writers Workshop, Jack Jones Literary Arts, and Paragraph New York. Sabrina is the author of the chat book, Dyke Geology, with Black Lawrence Press and the catapult column, My Life in Sea Creatures. Her essay collection inspired by that column, How Far the Light Reaches, is forthcoming with Little Brown in 2022. Angela Chen is a journalist and writer in New York City. Her reporting and criticism have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Atlantic, Guardian, Paris Review, Electric Literature, Catapult, and elsewhere. Chen is a member of the ACE community and has spoken about asexuality at academic conferences and events, including World Pride. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Sabrina and Angela. Hi, Angela. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks so much for doing this with me. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's funny, you know, Angela and I actually met on a panel. Uh, so it's very nice to be seeing you again in the same format. <laughs> Just brings um, back old times. Yeah, though that was in person, so. It's like it was in person. Um, we also both live um, on the East Coast right now, but we are originally from California. So it feels like this um, panel is almost like a way of visiting. <laughs> at least that's how I'm thinking about it. Same, same. It's nice to be at a California-based institution. Absolutely. And thank you to the California Institute of Integral Studies for having us today. Um, well, Angela, I loved ACE um, and I thought it filled, uh, you know, a big gap in literature that we have about um, asexuality. It was accessible, it was inclusive, and it was an exploration of sort of the broad spectrum of ACE experience. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, when did you first start thinking about writing this book and what made you decide to write it? I started thinking about it in 2015, so a long time ago. And the short answer as to why I wanted to write it was because I, that was when I was realizing that I was ace. And I say realizing because, or even discovering, I say discovering because it felt like it was something that I had to go out and search for to understand myself. It was not something that was in the air. It was not something that was in the understanding. It was not something that I could just casually glean the way we can for heterosexuality, for example. And so once, you know, once I learned I was ace and started learning about asexuality, I was like, this explains so much, not just about me and my life, but it just gave me a new way to look at the world and a new lens through which to, you know, think about relationships and romance and consent and all these things. And there weren't that many mainstream books about it. Uh, my ace isn't the first one. I don't want to pretend that it is, but there weren't books that were reported and had those narratives of, you know, other ace people. The, so I wanted to do that because I was a journalist. And it, ace has this interesting place in my career because, as you know, I'm primarily a science journalist. Most of my other work is like, you know, what's going to happen with deep fakes? What does, <laughs> like, what is AI going to take over the world? And so I never thought I would write a book like this. And in some ways, you know, in some ways when I was writing, I was like, do I want to be publicly asexual? Do I want to, you know, write so openly about my own life and my own identity? And I think that was something I was nervous about, but it really felt so important to have this book out there because it's so underreported and mm. yeah, there needed to be more. Did you ever consider writing the book, I guess, without including a lot of personal experiences, more just like a, like a bird's eye view or more reported? I don't think so. And I think it's because it was important to me that if this book existed, that an ace person would write the book. And that if an ace person write the book, you know, why not include your experience? Why not let yourself be an avatar of, you know, like something that may be like a mirror 
for others. And I'm not saying I'm a mirror for others. Like there are many ACEs whose experiences are so different, but also since the book has come out, people have said, oh, I like the memoir parts because you were describing when talking about your own life, things that I had felt myself. And so I think that was valuable. No, that definitely makes sense. I mean, I really liked your presence in the book. It felt like you were one of the many people that you interviewed and almost felt like you were sort of in conversation with yourself, um, which was fun. Well, I, I wanted to ask, you know, you know, you mentioned when you're searching for this, um, yeah, when you're trying to read books and find literature on asexuality um, and and sort of, yeah, coming up with, with not as much as you wanted. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the history of the modern asexuality movement. Um, you know, your book talks about how it's pretty recent and also fairly online. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing they always say, asexuality itself, um, and here I should just do a quick definition, you know, being ace means you don't experience sexual attraction. And there's a whole bunch of misconceptions around that, but we'll just go with that definition for now. So asexual people, have been around for a very long time. And the example they always cite is that in the 1950s, when Kinsey was coming up with his, you know, Kinsey scale of sexual orientation, he essentially interviewed people who were ace, but they didn't fit into his scale where you're, you know, homosexual or bisexual or heterosexual. And so he just made them this group, this other group, group X, and took them off. And so because the Kinsey scale is so dominant to the way that we think about ourselves and our sexualities, it felt like there was no framework for thinking about asexuality. And so in a way, I think so much of my book is actually very philosophical and it's about language. You know, if you if there's no word for what you are, if there's no, you know, social understanding for what you are, how can you explain that? And what gets lost when that part of you isn't affirmed? So that's kind of the deeper background. Um, so definitely ace people have been around for a long time, but the internet I think was really crucial for facilitating um, the modern ace movement. So in the early 2000s, there started to be groups of people, like there was a Yahoo group um, talking about you know, being asexual, like feeling different, like not wanting sex, like what did that mean? And then the group AVEN, the Asexuality Visibility and Education Network, which is still around, that was created in 2001. And that really became this, um, this touchstone, you know, a place where people could gather. And it was through that, that people were discussing, what does it mean to be asexual? Like literally, what does the word mean? Even the word asexual came out of those conversations. Like you can see a world in which people were called non-sexual instead, right? So, so much of the modern ace movement and what we take for granted as canon, you know, the definitions that I use, that other journalists use, that, you know, academics use, they were created by people who found each other online in the early 2000s, which is really recent. And so, you know, so much of the discussion is still ongoing. Mm. No, I mean, that's, that's really cool. Um, and I mean, I, I have some questions about how you use and talk about language in the book, but I want to ask those later. Um, and I wanted to ask, you know, a follow up question, you talk about how there are still lots of misconceptions about asexuality. And so I was wondering if you could sort of yeah, elaborate on how asexuality is still misunderstood um, in society. Absolutely. So I think the easiest way to talk about it is how I misunderstood it. So I came across the word asexual when I was 14 and it was, you know, a person who doesn't experience sexual attraction. And I was like, great, um, that's interesting. But I thought I was straight. I didn't think I was ace because I thought that not experiencing sexual attraction meant that you were interested in sex or that you hated sex but it's not, you know, to really understand what asexuality is, you have to understand what sexual attraction is. And when you say that people are like, oh, like that's so obvious. It's when I want to have sex with people, but then it's like, why? Like, don't you sometimes want to have sex with people for emotional reasons? Don't you sometimes want to have sex because you're bored or feeling lonely? So like the easiest way to put it, there are people who are asexual and they're sex repulsed, you know, they're not interested in sex. There are people who are asexual and sex indifferent, and there are people who are asexual and sex favorable. You know, just because you don't experience sexual attraction doesn't mean that you necessarily avoid sex entirely. And there are so many emotional reasons to have sex. And there's just so much complexity there. And I think that's what leads many people to not realize they're asexual when maybe they are. I mean, that was the case for me because in our society, and again, this goes back to language, we really think about like sexual desire and sexual attraction and romantic desire and aesthetic attraction, like all of these things we bundle up. 
And so it's very hard to think about them systematically and realize like, what exactly is it I'm feeling? Is it a mix of like aesthetic attraction and emotional attraction, sexual attraction? Is there no sexual attraction? So all of those things make it hard for people to understand their asexuality. And that's why there's so many misconceptions. Um, and then there's also more common misconceptions like that asexuality is the same as celibacy, which is not celibacy is behavior. Sexuality is like you're feeling your attraction or that people who are asexual is caused by disability or caused by sexual trauma or that asexuality is the same as aromanticism, which is more like not wanting relationships. So still even, you know, 20 years on, there's so many misconceptions that like we still need to be having this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when I first started this book, I thought that I had a good understanding of asexuality. Mm -hmm. And I feel like each chapter sort of like put an entirely new like post-it on the wall. And when I had finished mm -hmm. it, it was just this enormous wall of like post-its of just like ways to be ace that I had never thought of before or like never encountered. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that this exists and like hopefully will serve as like a kind of guidebook for a lot of people who are questioning or are just interested in sort of learning more. Um, yeah, I, well, I wanted to, um, you know, ask a little bit about compulsory, um, compulsory sexuality mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the assumption that everyone is like a sexual being who experiences sexual attraction. You talk a lot in the book about how it, you know, it manifests like unassumingly, but almost insidiously in a lot of aspects of everyday life, like conversations with friends or therapy or encounters mm -hmm. in medicine. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So compulsory sexuality, it builds off Adrian Rich's idea of compulsory heterosexuality. And like you said, it's the idea that everyone, you know, has sexual desire and wants to have sex with other people, even if you're not having it. It's not based on whether you're actually having sex or not. And so one example, I interviewed a man named Hunter who comes from this religious family. And, you know, growing up was all very purity culture and abstinence culture. But despite that, there was a lot of compulsory sexuality. The way he put it, he was like, everyone knew that you couldn't have sex until you were married, but that sex was good and it was a gift from God. And there was this assumption that everyone was fighting against, you know, this desire to have sex. So Hunter actually, um, when he was in college at some point, picked up this book about fighting, you know, taming your sexual desires. And then later on, his friends were like, oh, it's, it's actually not fair that you were asexual. You didn't have these sexual desires that other people had. But in the moment, like when he was in college, he was just like, oh, it's easier for me. Like he didn't realize that the experience was fundamentally different from other people's. So that's kind of a narrative example. But there's so many other examples in everyday life. You know, I've heard from aces who say they go to the doctor and the doctor will be like, oh, are you sexually active? You know, birth control, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll be like, no, I'm asexual. And the doctor will be like, is, are you like, are you okay? Like, were you traumatized? A big example, um, and which might be interesting for um, this audience is therapy. Like, I think many ACEs say it's very hard to find ACE friendly therapists because there's always the assumption that if you don't experience sexual desire or you don't want to have sex, that it's because you're repressed somehow, or it's because something happened to you that you need to work through in therapy. So often I hear from ACEs that their experience is invalidated um, by therapists. And I mean, of course, there's always this line, right? Like, of course, in many cases, people's discomfort with sex does come from, you know, other issues, but it doesn't always have to be the case. So those are some of the big ones that I can think of. But I think just the, the everyday experience of ACEs who hear all the time that, oh, are you are you a prude? Are you frigid? Is there something wrong with you? Like those just show how much compulsory sexuality there is. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And that's, that's part of why like awareness is so important because I'm sure that a lot of these people haven't, you know, read about asexuality mm -hmm. or properly engaged, especially as like therapists should um, mm -hmm. to understand, yeah, like what is just okay and not something that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, you know, you bring up Hunter, um, who's one of the characters in your book, and uh, ACE includes, you know, just a vast number of interviews with um, members of the ACE community who all have just these different experiences. And something that I really enjoyed, like, again, using Hunter's experience as an example was sort of learning or unlearning alongside people as they sort of dismantled the things that they were taught to believe about themselves and then sort of like, came to an identity that they felt really happy with and they found, um, you know, that they were at peace with. Um, but there are so many interviews in the book and I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about how you um, met those people and sort of developed trust um, and relationships with your sources. 
Absolutely. So from the beginning, I knew this was going to be a heavily reported book. When I was selling it, I think there was one publishing house that was interested in, in it, maybe as a memoir. And I knew that I didn't want to do that because because there's really not enough ace representation. And so when there's not enough ace representation, any one book feels like there's a lot of pressure on it. And a memoir would be my story, right? And then I didn't want people to think like, I didn't want to become the face of asexuality when there was so many other experiences that needed to be told. So I knew I was going to find, you know, gender non-conforming aces and aces of color and disabled aces um, to talk about their various experiences and how asexuality intersects with their other identities. For me, a lot of it was talking to people that I knew and putting the word out because I'm a member of the ace community. I know other aces. I know ace organizers. So a lot of it was just saying, oh, can you, you know, ask your networks if there are people who'd be willing to talk to me. I, um, there were a couple of listservs that I reached out to there. At one point, I think I might have posted on, on Reddit for like a very specific, um, I think, demographic that I was trying to reach. But with all of them, I think the fact that I was ace was really helpful. You know, it was like, I understand where you're coming from. We're not, you're not gonna spend time educating me. I'm not gonna ask you invasive questions. I'm not going to come in assuming that asexuality isn't real. And I think with that, and I think being pretty open about how I was going to use their story and how and why I was interested in talking to them and what, what, what I wanted from them essentially, I think that kind of honesty and forthrightness also help them build trust. And also because the book is not in any way intended to be a gotcha book. You know, at points I'm critical of the ACE community, but I'm not critical, you know, of the people who are being very vulnerable and sharing their stories. So I did fact check with them at the end to make sure I got everything right. That, that makes sense. And um, what, what has been the, their like reception of the book upon its publication? I think most people have been have been happy with it. You know, I definitely think that at least the people that I've interviewed and who, who have read it so far um, seem to be ha happy with how um, they were portrayed and happy with kind of the arc of the book. Mm. I mean, that's that's a relief. <laughs> as a, yeah. yeah, as a journalist, I'm always very scared if people are going to hate the story. Mm -hmm. um, well, something that I really appreciated about, you know, the ace people who do show up as sort of large um, and prominent characters in your book is a lot of them experience the world at an intersection of lots of different identities. You know, you speak with aces of color, disabled aces, trans aces. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of why that diversity of perspectives was um, important to share. Mm -hmm. I think that sexuality always intersects with other um, facets of your identity. You know, I think sexuality is psychological. I think it's parts of it are biological. I also think it's very social. And so the social part was important for me to influence because it intersects with these questions of power. And you know, the question of who gets to be asexual or who finds it easiest to claim to be asexual is a complicated one that has a lot to do with the history of how power works in the US. So to be specific, you know, I talked to aces of color and asexuality, at least the online um, groups seems pretty white. Oftentimes you go to meetups, it seems pretty white. And, the res and I think a lot of that is because whiteness is associated with sexual purity, you know, whereas we have these we have these stereotypes, which of course are wrong, these stereotypes, you know, that Black people and Latinx people are hypersexual or that Asian women are somehow simultaneously hypersexual and submissive at the same time. And all of these stereotypes can make it really hard um, to, to claim asexuality than if you were white. You know, so I interviewed someone who was Asian and they said, you know, why, who is socialized as an Asian woman. And they said, why would I identify as asexual when it was already assumed? Or I interviewed someone who was black and then she said there were just so few people in the black community and asexuality felt, asexuality felt like it was a white thing. And she was really questioning herself. She was like, oh, am I actually asexual? Or do I just really, really hate the way that the media portrays black women as hypersexual? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like making up this orientation, you know, kind of as a response to that. You know, when you don't get to be the default, then you have all of these questions and those that affects the makeup of the ACE community. And that, you know, in the same way that sexuality, any kind of sexuality intersects with race, that's the case for asexuality too. And I think it's even more complicated when it comes to disability because those are two communities that have really had, that have been marginalized in different ways. People have long thought that 
asexuality or what looks like asexuality is some kind of medical disorder. So for a long time, aces were like, oh, you know, we, we're not disabled, we're not sick, we're perfectly fine and healthy. And at the same time, the the disabled community has often been desexualized against their will. You know, people think they don't want sex. People think they're asexual when they're not. And so they're saying, you know, we, we do want to have sex. Don't, you know, desexualize us. And so for disabled aces, it feels like they're at this intersection of these kind of complex political movements. So all of that, you know, asexuality doesn't exist in a vacuum. It connects to so many things. So that would be interesting and important to explore that. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it also just helps like cement the book is just really a, a, like a broad sort of exploration of the ace experience. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess society really is the villain <laughs> um, in a lot of these cases. Um, I mean, when, when you talk to someone about their experience of their own asexuality, you know, you're encountering them generally at a point and like a certain understanding of their experience when you do that interview. So I was curious to know like, you know, when you were including your own experiences or using yourself as a case study, what that was like and whether your understanding or relationship to your asexuality sort of changed as you were writing the book. It, it did change in some ways, you know, I think that I've internalized a good amount of ace phobia and obviously I'm not proud of that and I think I'm aware of it, but I think that I wasn't aware of the extent to which I internalized it until I interviewed um, these two women, um, Selena and Yaz and Yasmin, who are, you know, they're ace and they're women of color and they're both just I guess they both kind of just like didn't care about being ace. You know, for me, I am so sensitive and I'm always like, well, will people think of me? Will they think that I'm boring? Will they, you know, like all the negative stereotypes that people have about ace people, I feel like I absorbed and that I cared about. And they were just like, well, I'm a nonconformist anyway. Oh, who cares what other people think? Or, you know, well, like I'm ace, but I dress very provocatively and I do it for me. And I like that other people are confused by it. So I feel like talking to them, it was, it really showed me, okay, your way of being your constant anxiety about how allo people see you, you know, that doesn't have to be the way that it is. And so I think that definitely, you know, just throughout the process of meeting the people that I was interviewing and talking to them, it gave me a lot more um, empathy for myself in a way. I think often it's much easier to have empathy for others than for you. And so I would talk to people who would talk about their struggles, which were maybe the same doubts or struggles that I had. And I'd be like, it's okay, like you shouldn't worry about that. And that made it easier to say it for me. Or I'd see other people who didn't care. I'd be like, okay, I, I can be like them too. Yeah, no, that's really beautiful. Um... I love that. And well, I, something else that I um, that I wanted to ask, you know, I, I also write about myself in the public um, and it can be pretty scary. And I, you know, I know that you're a professional science journalist and I wanted to ask you know, earlier, you mentioned like sort of being, yeah, like unsure if you wanted to come out as ace um, and in the book, you know, talking very like intimately about experiences that you have. Um, how did you sort of negotiate that line of like what you wanted to share and what you felt was important to share while also maintaining personal privacy? I think for me, it was mostly, I, I think I wrote like the reported and analytic parts of the book first. Um, and then it I would look at a spot and be like, where is this some place where my personal experience would be useful. You know, for example, there's, I think there's none of me in this, in the chapter about disability. I'm not disabled, that wouldn't be right. But in the chapter on feminism and kind of the tensions between sex positive feminine and asexuality, that is something that had affected me. And that is something where I felt like elements of my story or my framing could be useful. So it was mostly about what would serve the purpose of the book. I don't think there was any part of the book or any part of my story in the book where I was like, this has to be in it because it's a story I have to tell. Except maybe the story of how I, you know, figured out my own asexuality, that seemed very relevant. But it wasn't like I was trying to put the reporting into a memoir. It was more like elements of the memoir were there to kind of um, help me be a guide and kind of provide perspective for areas of the rest of the reporting and analysis. Definitely. I mean, it almost felt in, in a very positive way, like um, a Christmas Carol, where you sort of taking me through and showing me scenes. And then as soon as I was like, I was like, oh, wow, like you would pop up again. And I would be like, oh, like Angela's back. Or like, yeah, just like a personal anecdote. And I, I really love that structure. Um, 
it's well, interesting. Um, I was just going to say it's interesting to see, you know, the different responses to kind of the memoir parts, because definitely some people have said, you know, that's the part that I love the most. And that was so interesting. And then other people have been like, I love the analysis, but like I could do without her um, personal story, which is fair. And what's also really interesting is that, you know, some of the critiques I've gotten is about the memoir parts is about how I guess in a way it's like calling me kind of normie. It's like saying, it's like saying, oh, like her worries about um, being a good feminist or her worries about, um, you know, like how other people perceive her, you know, like why does she worry about these things? And I see these critiques and I'm like, yes, that is true. Like, why do I worry about these things? And I think I expected that kind of critique, you know, the you shouldn't care about these to begin with. But I wanted to be honest. And the truth is, I've been programmed, I do worry about these things. And I do worry about these kind of very normy topics. And so that's why I kind of said, you know, even though I want to be a mirror, I completely acknowledge there's so many aces out there who have such different experiences, um, who come at it in a different way. Absolutely. I mean, that honesty is so important. If you're talking about your personal experience, and like, yeah, I guess it would be like, you, you can't expect yourself to be like an ideal, like transcendent, mm -hmm. you know, person who has already figured it out and like gotten rid of all of that internalized dysphobia. Mm -hmm. Because, um, yeah, I mean, maybe some people are like that, but I, I really enjoyed those moments of, um, yeah, of, of honesty. And I mean, so much of the book is sort of nego is about negotiating what society, like the 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 square or whatever society is trying to put you in and like figuring out where you actually want to push out of that and like where you want to step out of that box um so i yeah i really appreciated those moments thank you um well i you know as an asian mm -hmm. uh, fellow asian woman who mm -hmm. grew up in california like in a very asian community um i was really interested in the parts of the book where you talk about how your race intersected with your journey towards identifying as, as asexual. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you talk about pushing up against the stereotypes of Asian women being, you know, passive, submissive, or doctors or engineers. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you've um, navigated and continue to navigate those cultural experiences and expectations, uh, both within and outside of the Asian community. Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, as you mentioned, I grew up in Northern California in Sunnyvale, and I moved here from China, Wuhan, actually a city now everyone knows where that is. So I moved here from Wuhan when I was five. And I think for most of my life, I really felt like race didn't matter, um, because it is a pretty Asian area, right? And it, I never like no one made fun of me. And like, I wasn't treated as strange or exotic or anything. And so it just felt like race didn't affect me. And then later on throughout my life, I was like, race does affect me in more subtle ways because of these expectations, you know, that Asians are not creative or Asians are software engineers or Asians are boring. And for what it's worth, my parents are software engineers and I did take violin lessons. So that feeling of there being a clear path for what it means to be Asian, even in a pretty Asian, you know, neighborhood and a pretty Asian demographic that did affect me. And then when it came to asexuality, it felt like it was something that was reinforcing these other stereotypes. You know, I felt like I was pretty affected by the stereotype that Asians are quiet and they keep their head down. And then of course, you know, being a woman, there's often many stereotypes about women being quiet and submissive. And then asexuality is often associated with this lack, you know, it's in the, it's in the word itself, asexual, like this lack and you don't have something that other people have. And you know, maybe aces are cold. And so it felt like this cascade in which if I, maybe if I weren't Asian, maybe if I weren't, you know, a woman, like I wouldn't have had that. But I definitely think that race and gender really intersected for me when thinking about how the, the sexuality, sorry, thinking about how the different factors kind of mix. And, you know, I've spoken to other Asian aces and many of them say they, they feel the same thing, you know, and that even though that, even though they feel secure in their aceness, a part of them at the back of their mind is like, oh, is it because Asians are supposed to be like this? You know, is it supposed to be, um, am I just bowing to stereotypes? And I think that's just another question that many minorities have to do, have to ask themselves constantly when negotiating this. Mm. Do you think you still are asking yourself these questions? Um, about whether, I still think about how race 
plays a role in pretty much every part of my life. I think in terms of whether race plays a role in my asexuality, I don't think so. I think now I've actually become more interested in whether other people, members of my family are ace and I don't know. But that's like, that's a whole different story. I don't know about your family, but my family does not talk about this kind of stuff. So, but like that's something that I'm interested in. So for me, it's become much more micro rather than macro, but I don't think I question that much if I'm really ace or not anymore. Mm. Um, that's a really fun way to uh, think about your family. <laughs> um, yeah, well, when I came out to my uh, family as queer, there was like a rough year. And now I just get like Facebook messages to like queer roller skating. And I'll be like, thanks, uh -huh. mom. Like, I'm not going to go to this, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, something that, you know, I, I expected ACE to do when I started was to offer, you know, a, a guided deep dive on the many facets of asexuality and the different, you know, ways that it can take form in someone's lives. Um, but what I didn't entirely expect the book to do was to make me like rethink the entire way that society has overvalued and almost like deified sexual relationships as the foundation of like a real or like important relationship. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how asexuality destabilizes that. Absolutely. So on one of the most basic levels, I think asexuality destabilizes this question of what even is like romantic attraction, right? Because when you're thinking, like, how do you know if what you're feeling towards someone is platonic or romantic? Most people will say, I know it's romantic because I want to have sex with them. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're actually sleeping with them. It's that feeling of, you know, sexual attraction that makes you know it's romantic. But then there are aces who are sex repulsed or sex indifferent, and they still experience romantic attraction. So the question becomes, Okay, so then what is romantic attraction then? If that's not the dividing line, what is? How do you tell the difference between romantic and platonic attraction? And it's so interesting because at the end of the day, like I ask everyone this, no one can really even explain what romantic attraction is. I, I know aces who are aromantic. I am not aromantic, but they're aces who are aromantic and they're like, no one can tell me what they're experiencing that I'm not experiencing. Um, what does it even what does it even mean? And when I was writing the book, I was reading a bunch of, you know, psychology and sociology studies that were about like that were academics looking at this question. And one academic had made a list of all of the things that around the world, cross culturally, they had determined separated romance from uh, you know, romantic versus platonic attraction. It was things like getting jealous and idealizing them and um, like wanting to be exclusive. And one person I interviewed was like, oh, but I can experience all of these with friends. I can be very jealous with friends. And there's exceptions too, right? If you're poly, then you don't necessarily want to be exclusive. So what's really interesting is there are not only aces who are aromantic, but there are aces who say that they can't even tell the difference between platonic and romantic attraction. Like the difference does not even compute to them. And I think that questioning that you know philosophical divide and thinking that maybe they're not mutually exclusive but there's some blurry overlap I think that's so interesting so that's one um, example and I have some others if that would be helpful I mean that no that totally makes sense and I think that like I love romance is a lie like I don't know if I could <laughs> define it and yeah I mean so much of this book made me like rethink my own experiences and like things I've always taken for granted which I really appreciated um, but I guess like since we're on the subject of, of you know I guess these, like what a close relationship could look like. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about queer platonic relationships, which um, pop up in the book as sort of a form of a very important and like integral relationship that has a lot of passion, but you know, doesn't include sexuality yeah, or sexual absolutely. attraction. Absolutely. And just on your point about rethinking romantic relationships, I think that that's exactly what I want people to do when they read the book. Because, you know, one person I quoted, they said something like, at one point in my life, I was like, do I actually want a romantic relationship with you? Or do I just love you platonically? And I just want to be validated socially, you know, by that love. And that's such an interesting question. And I think most of us thinking back on our lives can maybe apply that to some relationship of some kind that we've had. But anyway, um, on to queer, uh, I mean, absolutely. Time. I feel like that's why I dated men for so long, or at least cis men, because I was <laughs> like, I want, I want to be validated. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. Um, so on to queer platonic relationships. So it's a term that was developed around 2010, I think, though you'll have to check the book to, to fact check. It was and, by S.E. Smith, right? Yeah, S.E. Smith, um, who was a great journalist. So um, in 2010, and it was basically an idea like, 
a word for a new kind of relationship that did that came out of frustration with this world that always centered romantic relationships. And so queer platonic, I think for some people, they truly do feel differently inside um, for their queer platonic partner than they do for their you know, romantic partner or for their platonic friends. But I think for other people, it is a way to get away from language and expectations. You know, we when we think of the word friend, I think all of us have we've all been conditioned to understand what that is. And we think of the word romantic partner, we've been conditioned to understand what that is. And even if you think you don't, I think there's no way to get, a, to, no way to get around that, you know? Like with a romantic partner, if, I know people who said, if they see the romantic partner less than like three or four times a week, they're like, is it not working out? Because there's, there's this expectation that you see them so often. And with a friend, you know, usually we don't have that define the relationship talk um, because that's just not part of our framework and our script for friendship the way it is for romance. So anyway, a queer platonic relationship or partnership, I think for many people is a way to set the own terms of how you wanna to relate to someone. Um, one of the people that I interviewed, they said something like, for us, it was about being able to have these really explicit, emotionally open conversations. What am I to you? What are we to each other? when can I expect you to be there for me? What do we call what do we call each other? So it wasn't so much, I think, about unique feeling as about creating that structure and creating that container for a relationship um, that's not affected by these labels of like friend and partner and best friend and sex buddy or you know, whatever expectations you come up with. And I think that's so powerful because I do think we're trapped by language. And I do think that we overemphasize romantic relationships in a way that can be limiting. And I think that this idea is so um, interesting as a way to get around that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of sort of building your own containers so that you don't have to like miscategorize what is a really important and fundamental relationship in your life with a term like friend, which like people dismiss. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I also, I guess like aside from queer platonic relationships um, or you know different kinds of ace partnerships, I love the idea of doing a define the relationship talk with friendships. Mm -hmm. Like that feels like every relationship should have that. I feel like I listen to a lot of advice columns where people are like, you know, oh, I'm not sure if like my friend really likes them, like they're not texting me back or like mm -hmm. I feel like I reach out more than the other person and it just feels, mm -hmm. I, I guess communication is is always good, but I feel like I want to start having to find the relationship talks with my friends. I would love that. And then, but the truth is, I will confess that I don't have them with my friends. Like I talk a big talk, but I don't know if I walk the walk <laughs> again, because I feel like I'm shy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like in the society where there are many people who are still afraid to say I love you to their friends, even friends they clearly love and support, it almost feels like too much to ask to be sitting down and being like, you know, what, what are we to each other? I think that many of us are afraid of being perceived as ex extra or not chill or too much. And when that's not built into friendships, the way it is built into relationships, then it's just even harder to have the emotional clarity and strength to do that. I mean, we see this with romantic relationships too, right? Like so often someone usually the woman, I feel like in hetero relationships will want to have a define the relationship talk, but then she'll be like, oh, will I come off as, I don't know, too sure of what I want. You know, will I come off as like too pushy. So taking that, I think you have that dynamic even more so when it's um, in the friend or platonic realm. Mm. No, that, that definitely makes sense. I also wonder if I would walk the walk, but <laughs> for now, I really like the idea. Yeah, um, liking the idea is the first step to walking the walk. <laughs> It's just like that meme of the person like walking with the bag up the hill um, yeah. or up the staircase. Um, well, so one of my favorite parts of the book um, was the section on consent. And, you know, I identify as allosexual and it was one of the parts of the book that made me sort of step back. Like I, I was reading a PDF, but in in another world, I would have closed the book and like <laughs> contemplated my own experience. I think I just like minimized the PDF. Um, but it, it was really interesting how you talk about how like asexuality, you know, textures consent beyond like the traditional yes or no binary. Um, and, and the way that you write about it sort of like talks about how consent can change what like sexual rights and self-determination look like in any relationship. Um, so I was wondering if you, could, if you could talk a little bit about how asexuality, um, yeah, destabilizes these traditional binaries of consent. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think so much of the way we think about consent is predicated on the idea that everyone has this baseline of sexual desire. And there's also this idea that, you know, if if I don't want to have sex with a stranger at a bar, that's totally fine. I can say no to strangers every day for the rest of my life. But can I say no to my spouse every day for the rest of my life? There really is this idea that you know, entering a relationship means giving up a measure of consent. And I think some of that comes from the idea that, okay, everyone is sexual. So if you love your partner and you're a sexual person, why would you say no for no reason? You know, ACEs talk about the good enough reason. It feels like you need to have some kind of excuse, like I'm sick or you're mean. You can't just say, I don't want to, because that doesn't compute. It's like, if why, why would you not want to? So these assumptions are really embedded to how we think about um, consent. And I think ACEs argue, and I completely agree that if we think that no one is entitled, like no stranger is entitled to sex, even if they're super attractive and they're Gandhi levels of moral, like they're not entitled because <laughs> it's, you know, your body. And I think that should be extended to relationships too. You know, if we believe that for strangers, we should believe that for partners. And of course, partners have the right to prioritize their own, you know, sexual needs. And I completely respect that. But I think it's really important to you know, that sexual rights don't change or sexual rights are not given up when you enter a relationship. And right now, so often they are. And right now, so often the lower desired partner is seen as the problem and they need to fix it. Even though the problem isn't low desire, it, the problem is incompatibility and incompatibility, you know, it takes two to tango, it takes two to be incompatible. So it's, it's not just one person's problem, it's a shared problem. Mm. But going back to the, like, you know, the binaries of consent, we really think about like yes and no, or like yes means yes, or no means no, but it's not yes or no, right? Because there's a huge spectrum of sexual experiences that are partially consensual and also partially coerced. And I think we need to think about that. And also one problem I have with this yes means yes kind of enthusiastic consent idea is that if you make enthusiastic consent the only like real consent, then it kind of implies that many aces who don't or can't give enthusiastic consent can't consent at all. In reality, we should be thinking about levels of willingness. Um, and Emily Nagoski, who's a sex researcher and writer, has this great um, framework where she talks about enthusiastic consent and then willing consent and unwilling consent. And I think that's so much more subtle and so much more useful than being like yes or no. And then you're like bound and locked into what you said once at the beginning of an encounter. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I found that model really helpful. Um, yeah. Well, so something else I, I wanted to ask um, is sort of about the, the ethics of, of writing this book and, and who your audience was, because something that, you know, was thrown a lot around is, you know, it's not the job of people of color to educate white people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not their job to, yeah, explain it to people who oppress them um, or misunderstand them. So I was wondering, like, is it your job to educate allosexuals about the ace community? I don't think it's my job to educate allosexuals. I don't think it's any ace person's job to educate allosexuals. But I do think that if someone doesn't do it, I'm not sure aces will educate themselves. So for me, it's kind of like a matter of pragmatism. And I do think about this a lot, you know. For me, it's, um, it's like, am I, like, how do I write this book in a way that um, is explaining to aces, sorry, explaining to allos, but not pandering to allos. And for me, a lot of it is like, the validity of asexuality is not up for debate. Um, what I realized um, doing interviews that I have this kind of mental tick in which someone will like ask me a question about an argument and then I'll kind of explain what the other side thinks to try to be charitable and then go into my argument for why they're wrong. And I realized I just stopped doing that because I think it gets taken out of context, but that's not what I did for this book. Like I really started from the thought that like the validity of asexuality, the value of asexuality is not up for debate. But as for the question of, you know, is it my job to educate? No, but I think many people's lives, you know, people of any orientation would be better if they understood more. And so I'm glad to be trying to help um, spread that. Mm. No, absolutely. And I mean, it, it feels so important that a book like this is written from someone from the ACE community. Um, yeah, and and it is not your job, <laughs> but I'm very happy that you wrote the book. <laughs> um, well, something else that I wanted to ask, I guess, um, 
is, you know, there, as you mentioned earlier, like when you were searching for books that could sort of explain or talk more about ACE experiences, um, it, you know, you, you, you didn't find that many. Um, and so you tried to sort of fill that gap, but no one book can be exhaustive. Um, mm -hmm. So I, was, I wanted to ask like what it's like to sort of have that pressure. And if you um, were afraid of any kind of criticism from the ACE community. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I am and was, and that pressure is terrible. And, you know, the thing about me is that, you know, I was talking to someone about this. Um, I just worry a lot about things I can't control. Yes. Uh, and, you know, there's no way I can, there's no way I could have had a book that represents all of the ACE community. No book, like even the book was a thousand pages long. I couldn't do that. Even if there were 10 books, I couldn't do that because it's just so diverse. But of course, you know, and I think I said pretty clearly, like this book is not representative. I said it on the first page. It was, you know, the author's note, this book is not representative, but this is, I did the best I could and we should have more. But despite that, you know, I do think that people will see it and maybe think this doesn't represent my experience. Um, and that's fair, and that's fair, but I think we should be just be thinking structurally, right? You know, instead of putting all the pressure onto one person, any person, why is it that we don't have more books about um, other parts of the ACE spectrum? Why is it that we don't have a book about aromanticism? And, you know, I'm a journalist, you're a journalist, and I think both of us, you know, you have a book coming out, so I think both of us know a little bit about publishing. A lot of it are these structural issues. I've talked to people, writers who said that agents tell them, you know, asexuality doesn't sell, aromanticism doesn't sell. Um, I think most people in the publishing industry, gatekeepers, I'm pretty sure are allos. And so they have a very narrow and often unimaginative idea of what ace or arrow content could mean. Um, so just for one example, I recently published a story in The Atlantic, which was based partly off the last chapter about three parent families, you know, an ace man who um, is also aromantic and who is in a three person like unit um, and is the father to someone who is not the biological father too, and it has to do with three parent adoption. And it's so interesting and the story did super well. So I think it showed that there's a lot of hunger for these ideas, you know, ace ideas of how to connect um, beyond the traditional romantic structure, how to build family beyond the traditional romantic structure. But oftentimes gatekeepers aren't appreciating that or seeing that. And therefore one book about asexuality sells. And then that book has to be everything to everyone. And then I'm sitting here, you know, or I'm not able to sleep at night. So really we should be like thinking about structural change. You know, there need to be more books. And there's so many books that should be written that I'm not qualified to write and other people would be. Yeah, I mean, well, hopefully your book sort of opens the gates. You know, I feel like once one book sells well, like a lot of, there's like, a, you know, an appetite for them. Mm -hmm. um, and also everyone should read Angela's story in the Atlantic. It's really good. <laughs> um, and it also just, yeah, it, it, it does another thing about, you know, I think you called it like building these containers that don't exist and trying to create and like imagine different ways to live and, and parent and love. Um, yeah, I really loved it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, I mean, I, I wanted to ask, um, what you know some questions about asexuality are that are still being discussed you know you talk mm -hmm. about ace phobia and a shame and sort of the difficulty or confusion of what it means to separate like having a low libido from being asexual mm -hmm. yeah so i think there's just huge swaths of the community that um, don't get enough attention. And I mean, I really think, I'm pretty sure I'm right. I really think there's just a lot more ace people in the world than we think they are, but they just don't know they're ace because it's it's so hidden. And so more and more, like just since I published the book, people will write to me and some people will be aces being like, thank you for the book. And some people will be like, I realize that I'm ace and this is so interesting to me. So one of those um, pop populations is older people. You know, I've started hearing from people who were married and had children and realized they were ace and older people often feel like they don't belong in the ace community or that they're overlooked and I, I think they are not, I hope not because of explicit ageism, but just because many aces tend to be on the younger side, because so much of it is online and you know that's, I guess younger people are more online. So I think there's so much richness in, you know, the experiences of older aces and what that could teach us. There's so much richness in thinking about asexuality and all sexualities in this fluid way. You know, I think that the way we tend to think about sexualities is that they are they are rigid and they are set. And that's why it is a pejorative to say that someone has a phase or, you know, they're not really bisexual or, you know, gay or ace. 
And I don't think that's helpful. And I think that realistically people's sexuality changed a lot throughout their lives. And when asexuality was first being studied from a scientific perspective, it was always described as like this laugh, lifelong life, lack of sexual attraction. And now I think we're starting to, to move away from that. And so mm. what does that mean for understanding the ace community and ace identity? And what does that mean for how we understand ourselves and, um, and make sense of ourselves. So I think those are some interesting ones. And also there's still so much interesting stuff to think about when it comes to um, aromanticism and how that intersects. There are people who are aromantic and not asexual. There's so much interesting stuff about the medicalization of sex and you know all these efforts to make and find the beta boosting drugs. So there's so much richness out there. And I think really like so many of these are not just ACE issues, right? Like these questions of sexual fluidity, how much of a libido you should have, et cetera. They're issues for everyone. It's just, there's a different perspective being offered. Absolutely. I mean, one of the like scariest parts of the book, I think was, you know, the, the, the parts that talked about these drugs that are marketed to sort of like fix a low libido or something that yeah, would be prescribed to people oftentimes if the other person in, in you know, in the relationship who had a higher um, drive, um, you know, yeah, it, it, it was very scary. Um, and I feel like uh, I'm very pro abolish the phrase, mm -hmm. just a phase. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's wrong with exploring and changing? You know, I think all of us are always exploring and changing. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, I interviewed someone who, um, identified as asexual and was heavily um, sex repulsed. And later they, you know, they decided or they found out that they experienced sexual attraction toward one person, their girlfriend, and now they identify as demisexual. And their sexuality wasn't a phase or fake. They just, you know, they evolved. So mm -hmm. I think that's a good way of thinking about things. Absolutely. Um, um, I, I wanted to ask, you know, what else still needs to be done in, in your eyes in terms of ACE activism and what you would imagine a world without compulsory sexuality would look like? Yeah, so I always um, think about something that uh, the professor Christina Gupta wrote, which is talking about how you know, getting rid of compulsory sexuality isn't about desexualizing everything. Though personally, I think much of advertising should be desexualized. But you know, it's not about like desexualizing everything. It's about challenging the, I think the phrase something like unearned privileges that sexual people have. So for example, on the level of law, one thing I write about in the book is how, and this is not necessarily asexuality, this is maybe more about aromanticism, but I write about how, of course, you can give health insurance to a random person that you marry, but you can't give health insurance to your best friend or like your parent or your sibling. So there's all these laws that, privilege like romantic and sexual love among above other types of love and if those change I think that would be good for society um, we're talking about medicalization I think that understanding you know sexuality is a spectrum and not saying that low libido or low sexual desire or no sexual attraction is wrong that is an important point of activism um, I'm a staunch feminist but I think some parts of sex positive feminism really um, or some messages from sex positive feminism have mutated into this idea that like the more feminist you are, the more sex you have, the more sex you have, the more feminist you are, which mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, it, it's become this idea that if you aren't interested in sex, it has to be because of the patriarchy or it has to be because you're repressed. And sometimes people just aren't interested in sex because people are different. So like those kinds of pressures, I think getting rid of them would be good. And I think I really wanna emphasize that it's so intersectional you know, like sexual freedom for like, a, I think I read this at the end, you know, that a world that's welcome to aces, it's, it can't be compatible with rape culture. It can't be compatible with transphobia. There's trans aces, there's aces of color, you know, it's, there's so many intersections across other parts of the queer umbrella and just identity in general. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I really want to live in that world. Um, and <laughs> I hope that we can all work toward it. Yeah. Um, I, you, those are all the serious questions, but I had some fun ones that hopefully we can squeeze in. Um, you know, ACE involves so many experience or so many interviews um, and anecdotes from different sources, lives and, and people's experiences. But I know that books can never contain everything that you wanted to. So I was curious if there was anything, um, you know, particularly memorable, like an interview or like a negative fact uh, that you had to cut out of the book. Um, well, there was one that I cut out that I now wish I hadn't cut out because I use it all the time when I'm just talking to people. Um, and it's kind of, to me, it's like the best example of the way in which 
sexuality is so performative and the way in which we don't know what other people are thinking. So it's a story of someone that I interviewed who grew up in small town Oklahoma, someone that was very religious. And early on she realized well, she became atheist and she and her friends were atheists. And so they would all go to church and, you know, they would be praying or, you know, whatever they'd be doing. As one church. does. <laughs> yeah, as one does. They'd be going through the motions, but like making eyes at each other, being like, we have to do this. But we know it's, we, we think it's stupid. And then later on, she realized the same was true for her and sexuality. Like she was always the first person to like, be like, I tap that or, you know, like joke about someone's like, but, or like make fun of a naked Greek statue. But she thought that it was just all a joke in the same way that everyone was joking and they all thought sexuality was stupid. So then when her best friend had sex and they're all in their teens at this point. So when her best friend had sex, um, this girl was like, oh, did it hurt? Was it horrible? Did you hate it? And her friend was like, well, like this was something that I wanted. And it was the first time that this person was like, oh, like I thought it was all a big joke, but some people actually want to have sex. And I think that's such a good, like, you know, example. Cause I think it's very close to what my example was because growing up, I always would talk about like, who do I think is hot and who do I think is not hot? And you know, who I would- The binary. With. Yeah, the binary, right? <laughs> and who would I would sleep with and who I wouldn't sleep with. And I don't think I realized, it's, I didn't think that everyone else was like joking, but I don't think I realized that we were just using the words differently. Like when I said hot, I was like, for me, it was like beautiful. Like they have nice skin and like a very defined jawline. And then they were like horny, you know, like their like experience is different. And I think that's something that was a light bulb moment for me and for a lot of aces that I interviewed. Mm. I mean, I'm really happy that you shared that anecdote because it, it is super helpful and hopefully, yeah, it'll, it'll become something one day or maybe just, you know, like a helpful anecdote um, mm. at panels. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Ace came out, um, but, and I, you know, I, in publishing, you write your book and then you have to wait like a lot of months before it comes out. So I wanted to ask if you were working on any other creative projects, whether about asexuality or non like unrelated projects that you've been working on. Um, there is one anthology that's supposed to come out. I don't even know when, maybe 2022. Maybe oh, I saw that. Yeah, it's, um, so it's the something, maybe the 50th anniversary of Helen Gurley Brown's book, Sex and the Single Girl, which was this enormously influential book about exactly what the title suggests and I'm going to have an essay in there about it and I haven't written it yet but I think that what I'm going to write it about is you know the relationship between like asexuality and aromanticism and you know beauty and power because you know so often physically attractive aces are told things like oh it's a shame you're so like you're ace because you're so beautiful and if you look beneath that, you're like, wait a minute, why is it a shame? <laughs> like, why can't I just be beautiful because I'm beautiful? Uh, my beauty is not to be enjoyed by you. And I think it explores a little bit of the fact that for me, even though I'm ace, um, I've never had an ace partner, but for a long time, I didn't want an ace partner because even though I didn't experience sexual attraction, I wanted to be sexually desired by others because it felt like a form of power. And it felt like mm. a form of power that as a woman, I'm socialized to believe that I'm supposed to be able to have. And it felt, it, it felt primal, you know, like it felt primal and like uncontrolled and lustful in a way that felt more safe to me than, you know, other forms of, of love, I think. And so this theoretical essay, which I will finish and write in case the editors are watching this, um, will, will be forthcoming. But I think most of my other projects are going to be science journalism. I miss that and I want to go back to that. And what topics do you write about in science journalism? Um, I do a lot of stuff on artificial intelligence. So maybe it's more like technology journalism, but mm. I'm interested in like tech ethics, you know, stuff like what's going to happen with deep fakes. The surveillance state is coming for us. Um, with the end it of is. privacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, something that I, I like a very small nugget that I noticed in the book um, was that you mentioned that, you know, you had this goal to run a half marathon, um, mm. which is daunting to me. Mm -hmm. And you talk about like, sort of interrogating why you wanted to run a half marathon is a helpful way of sort of modeling how you would interrogate like, you know, what you really want when it comes to sex. Um, and by the end of the book, you did not run a half marathon. Mm -hmm. um, they're very difficult to train for. Mm -hmm. um, but last week, you actually did run a half marathon mm -hmm. in 92% humidity, which <laughs> sounded unpleasant. <laughs> but I wanted to ask what that experience was like. 
Well, the experience was horrible, but thank you for reminding me that I'd written about that in the book, because as you mentioned, you know, the, you write the book and it's like a year and it comes out. So I actually forgotten that particular part. Yeah, it's interesting because at the, like I use that as an example of like something that I didn't really want to do. And then I guess, you know, since then, obviously I've taken up running and I decided that it was something that I wanted to do. And I think it was just something that I thought was difficult to do and kind of impressive and I don't know if those are the best reasons to do something but those were my honest reasons for completing the half marathon despite being frankly severely undertrained and I didn't eat anything beforehand so it just goes to show that we are always evolving you know and the version of what I thought in the book is like two years old by this point so yeah we all change we're all fluid absolutely was there did you like decide that day to run it or um did you plan it ahead of time um, it, I decided like the night before that I was going to do it because I was like, I want to do it. And I'm eating a lot of pasta. And then the next morning I was kind of like, well, I've eaten all this pasta. Like, I don't want to like waste the carbs that I ate the night before and like the good sleep that I got. So it was interesting because, you know, the, I don't remember it anymore because it was so terrible. <laughs> like the, like four miles of it were good. And then like the last three miles, I was like, I, I, can't go on, which actually is similar to the process of writing the book. You know, like I truly do not remember much of the process anymore um, because there was such a time deadline. I think you know this, but I wrote the book basically on nights and weekends while holding down a full-time job in journalism. And I think about that a lot in a kind of wistful way, like how would the book be different if I had more time and resources? And I think it's good for what I was able to do, but because of that enormous deadline rush. Um, truly, when I think back, I, it's like a blank in my mind. Yeah, I mean, you know, thinking about it, um, writing a book on nights and weekends while holding a full time job yeah. in journalism is actually much harder, maybe than running a half marathon. So <laughs> I, I'm very impressed. Harder. Yeah, I'm really impressed that you did both. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's time for um, the Q&A section of okay. this talk. So I'm going to open the Q&A box. Um, amazing. So we have a question from Lizzie. Um, what would you say to the notion of evolving feelings, such as in cases of sapiosexuals, romantic or sexual attraction that develops after an intellectual relationship forms, and or demisexuals, emotional bond precedes attraction? Is this entirely separate from asexuality? So demisexuality is part of the ace community. So um, it, it's, I talk about this a little bit in my book where in some ways it feels a little bit unintuitive because even if, because even if you're demisexual, you still experience sexual attraction, but the ace umbrella, it's not supposed to be like a line on one, you know, with like aces on one end and owls on the other end and like demisexuals in the middle. It really is this umbrella that encompasses a lot of overlapping experiences. So definitely demisexuals are part of the ace spectrum. I don't, think sapiosexuals are. Um, I, I mean, don't quote me on that. I, I don't think they are. I'm not the, I am not the expert, but I think in general, when it comes to these kinds of ideas and terms, I'm just in favor of people using the terms that feel like they're, they're useful. Because I think that once you have a term like demisexual or a term like sapiosexual, then you can Google that term and you can find other people talking about it. And find more resources. You know, I think a lot in science journalism, sometimes I'll be like, what's the word for like the, um, the field that's like kind of chemistry and kind of physics. And before you know what the word is, in this case, material science, you're just like Googling random things and you can't find the resources you need. And then once you have the word, you can find the resources. So I, you know, oftentimes people will be like, demisexual, sapiosexual, you know, why do people need to have those words? And for me, I don't think they're hurting anyone. I don't think we should think about them as these mutually exclusive things. They can just be descriptors. And I think that people need these words because they resonate with something about how they are and who they are. You know, I don't use a lot of terms that maybe could describe me because I don't feel like I need them, but there are terms I use that do describe me because they're helpful. So yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I love the way that you talk about language in your book and sort of how you argue for this expansiveness, like this expansive vocabulary of the ace experience. Because yeah, if, if something doesn't apply to you, like it maybe it will apply to someone else. And like, if, yeah, it can be hard to Google parts or questions about yourself that you might have. And the more that's out there, the, the easier it is to find yourself. 
Yeah, there's a lot of stories of aces who before they, you know, came across the word asexuality, they like, they independently came up with it or they mm. or they call themselves non-sexual or they were like Googling things like, is it normal to not want to have, you know, like once you have the word, it's just so helpful. It's like a portal to helping you get what you need. Absolutely. Well, I will thank you, Lizzie. Um, we have a question from the audience. Where can I find advice for dating as an ace person? Ooh, that one is hard. And the honest answer is I don't know, because as far as I know, there I don't think there's ace dating columns. So I, I would say in general, there are ace resources. So, you know, there's a thriving community on Tumblr. There's this blog called the Asexual Agenda that I really like. And what I like about the Asexual Agenda is that it's a lot of high level um, you know, ace discourse. And then through that, you can find the authors that you like, and then it'll, it'll guide you into the online world. Because when I first joined, I was like, who are these people? And I was totally overwhelmed. Um, but as for particular resources, as in like columns, like, I don't know if that exists yet. And that definitely should now that I think about it. Amazing. Um, this is a question from the audience. I sometimes feel like coming out as ace is kind of weird. Like, why should my family or friends care whether or not I feel sexual attraction or if I am having sex? I would love to hear your comments about this. I have come out to only a few people, but not my parents. Yeah, absolutely. So I also feel this way. Um, so whoever asked that, you are not alone. And I think the reason is because asexuality is so embodied. You can't you can't pretend it's like love is love and you can't pretend it's about romance, you know? Like if you say I'm bisexual, it's like, oh, I want to spend my life with men and women. Um, but when you're asexual, it really is about like sexual attractions, about what you experience in your body. It's kind of like saying, oh, I don't get horny, which feels can feel deeply inappropriate. Um, so for that reason, I say this a lot. I I'm like semi out. Obviously I'm out if you have google.com, but you know, like with my parents, we just, I said this before, like we don't talk about this. They, I refuse to tell them what my book is about and I guess they don't have google.com. So, you know, I'm still negotiating this myself. So I do think that there is value in coming out. I think that there's challenges to it. You know, I have talked to people who say they work in more conservative workplaces and coming out as ace does feel, it feels like there's a double standard. Like coming out as ace feels different than if they were coming out um, in another way. So I, I guess I just want to say like those, feel, I think there are difficulties associated with coming out as ace that maybe aren't there in other circumstances. And I also feel like coming out as ace can still be a good thing and can help you find people. But I don't think anyone needs to feel like they have to because it can be tricky. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a final question, which is from Ash. How do you begin to have a conversation with a partner on the idea of not being sexually attracted to them without them feeling offended or slighted because of the whole idea of if you're not sexually attracted to me, then why do you even want to be with me? That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. And I think that that question always starts with needing to, um, with like acknowledging this soup that we're all kind of swimming in with all of these ideas about how the like how the desire of your part or the amount of desire your partner has says something about you. So, you know, I interviewed someone who said something like their partner was convinced that she was asexual because he wasn't hot enough. And of course that like created a lot of problems in the relationship. And she said, you know, like once I made him understand, like it's not about him. Um, it like, he could be 10 times hotter um, and or like 10 times less hot and it wouldn't change anything. She was like, it was like a light bulb went off for him. So I think, first of all, it's like acknowledging that yes, oftentimes we do base our own value on how much other people, you know, are sexually attracted to us. And I don't think that's right, but that can be a real source of pain for people. So being compassionate. I also think that embedded in that question is that your, your theoretical partner seems to think that sexual attraction is the only reason to be with someone when well, that's just so not the case. Um, I think for allos in long-term relationships, like many people just don't have sex as often. And you know, this is not an ace thing. There's so many reasons to be with someone that are not sexual. You know, you 
have a great chemistry. Otherwise, you care for each other, you have a long shared history. So I think emphasizing those things. But I think a lot of it really is about kind of saying like, it's not you, it's not me. There's so much in this relationship that's valuable. And also accepting that they might feel slighted and to give them space and allow them to, to feel that way. You know, I think for many people, it's really hard to get rid of that conditioning that's like, oh, if someone's not sexually attracted to me, that means my worth is lower. So it'll take a lot of evolving conversations. Absolutely. Um, I was also, uh, there are actually more questions. So I okay. take back what I said about being it being the final question. This is a question from Aloysius. You talk about intersections like gender and race and social norms, et cetera. Have you factored in neurodivergence? Have you looked into the communication differences between the two when it comes to relating? Um, definitely. So the, the first question is neurodivergence is not like a specific chapter in my book. And the reason I was talking about those other things because they're specific chapters. Um, definitely a huge proportion of the ACE community is neurodivergence. And so I do think that is something that I read about briefly. Um, and it's a lot of people who are um, for example, autistic and ace, they'll say things like, if I wasn't autistic, I think I would have realized that I was asexual much earlier because there's all these stereotypes that ace, that you know people with Asperger's or people with autism just are supposed to like have trouble relating or that, you know, it's like normal for them to not be interested in sexuality. So definitely neurodivergence does come up in the book a little bit, mostly people talking about how there is that like there is that question, like, is it neurodivergence? Is it my autism or is it asexuality and how I can decide? And then the rest of that chapter talks a lot about how kind of question that question, like it, can, can it be both? Like, it, is it okay either, either way? And I also talk a little bit about neurodivergence when I talk about the pressures for ACEs to appear normal, you know, normal. There's so much pressure for ACEs to appear normal. And, you know, I've talked to ACEs who said things like, I didn't want to, like I feared that by being ace and neurodivergent, I was giving asexuality a bad name or that people would say wasn't ace, I was, it, it was autism. So there's a lot of pressures that come in dealing and negotiating those two identities. Mm. Thank you for that answer. This is a question from Mia. As a future therapist, can you please tell me in your opinion, what is the most important way for me to serve my ace clients in therapy? Yeah, this is a great question. I think definitely the most important thing is to be very validating of them. I know that sounds so simple, but it's, it is really the norm that when someone is like, I'm ace, or even if they don't use those words, if they say like, I have low sexual desire, um, I don't have a high libido, I'm not sexually attracted to people, um, to, to, to affirm that and be like, maybe that's okay. You know, so a, you know, if they're ace, of course, say like, you know, being ace is great, et cetera, et cetera. But even if they're talking, maybe they don't know what asexuality is. Even if they're talking about an experience that maybe sounds like asexuality, I think it'd be really valuable to um, offer ace resources to them and say, maybe this is something you should look into. Because, you know, we talk about the difference between, people talk about the difference between normal low libido and asexuality, but plenty of aces were people who used to identify as aloe and then realized they were ace. Like there's a very blurry and porous line between them. So I think a lot of that is, is about affirming. Um, recently, I was talking to someone who said that he had been molested as a child and he also identified as ace. And he always was like, okay, am I really ace? Is it just because of my childhood history of sexual trauma? And then he said that his therapist was very affirming that it, like no matter the cause, he could still be ace, he could still be valid. And that was really impressive to me because especially when you're dealing with asexuality and some other thing that seems like it could be the cause, like disability or sexual trauma, it can be very easy to be like, oh, you just think that you are, but actually once you fix this other problem, then you'll fix your asexuality too. And then being able to make space, like you can be, like all these things can be true, I think was really powerful and helpful for him. I'm really happy that he was able to work with that there. Me too, yeah. This is a question from Lizzie. Uh, what do you think would help get the idea of these queer platonic relationships slash friendship defining conversations into the mainstream? What do you think might, might make it easier for you to broach these conversations? Parentheses, asking for a friend, dot, <laughs> dot, dot. 
for a friend? That is such a good question um, because obviously I admitted to not exactly walking walking the walk. Mm, in terms of what would make it easier to get it to the public, I mean, what do you think, Sabrina? You're all you're also a journalist. I'm actually curious what you think here. I don't know. I mean, I guess like just do. I, I feel like I have to do it and then just like talk about it. Um, I think that. I mean, I, you know, I listened to this podcast, Dear Prudence, and um, mm -hmm. a lot of the, uh, I think, questions and advice are, are kind of like along the lines of like, how do you communicate better with your friends? And I feel like, yeah, it, it makes so much sense to me to sort of have this defining conversation where you talk about like how much you want to participate it, in it. Um, I don't even want to count like the amount of hours I've spent wondering whether someone wants to hang out with me, like wondering if I'm texting them too often, like being scared about that. and. I, yeah, I guess this isn't really like how to get it into the mainstream, but I feel like I can't really talk about it until I start doing it. So maybe the answer is I have to start doing it. I think that's true. I think for most of us, we just, you know, be the change you want to see in the world to be a little bit um, hokey. Like, I think it's just for us to model the behavior. Like I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in therapy and I read a lot of books about therapy and it's always like model the behavior that you would like others to see. So I think a lot of it is about the people who want to do that, getting over their instinctive aversion to it and having that conversation. As for the question of how to get in the mainstream, as a journalist, my very unimaginative answer is I think more people should write about it. And maybe I'll write about it or something. But just for example, um, more people read articles than books for obvious reasons. They're shorter, they're more accessible. And when I wrote the article about the three-parent family, first of all, I got a lot of mean responses from people who were like, who were like, this has mm. gone too far. But then I actually got a lot of people saying things like, oh, I didn't think I wanted a family, but I want a family like this. Or, oh, I didn't know that family like this was possible. I thought that you had to have, you know, two parents. Um, and like, the only way it could be three is if it was like a poly relationship. So I think, yeah, like, I think that's the power of journalism and cultures to try to get that out there. Yeah. And I mean, also, I don't know if this is the mainstream, but I feel like talking to your friends about mm -hmm. these conversations, not even just like diving into having yeah. them, but I feel like floating the idea and like seeing if it's like something that people would be interested in. Um, I feel like I'm trying to do a better job at communicating with my friends now that everything is like remote and mm -hmm. a lot of the conversations we have are textual. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is a good time <laughs> to start experimenting. Yeah, and I guess last ditch, we could just pay some influencers, right? We can pay Kylie Jenner or something to get it out there. Can we afford Kylie Jenner? No, but... <laughs> A girl can dream. Um, this is a question from the audience. Do you know of any music or musical artists showcasing asexuality? Okay, so I don't off the top of my head, but I recently did see on Twitter. So I feel like this is extremely unhelpful and I'm sorry, but someone had created a like asexuality playlist. And I don't think it was, I don't think it was necessarily by asexual artists, but I think it was like songs that had ace themes. And so all I can remember about it, and I'm sorry, this is not helpful, but it was related to a conference that was academic conference that was recently held um, on the topic of early modern asexualities. So I think if you go on Twitter and type in early modern asexualities and scroll through some of the replies, you'll find like the announcement and there was a playlist there. So I haven't listened to it yet, but I do remember coming across that recently. Mm. I, I guess I just wanted to expand that question a little bit. Do you know of any artists showcasing asexuality who you enjoy? I don't think so. You know, I really think that um, asexuality or ace themes, again, are not well represented in the culture. You know, I mean, I think so many songs are romance songs, right? And mm. so many songs are like, I want your body tonight or something like that. And then I guess when I, when I hear songs that are not showcasing asexuality, like to me, they're like songs about, being sad that, you know, your parent died or something. So I don't know if that's like a, is that like an asexual song? That doesn't seem quite right to me. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've seen good music that really explores ace themes. Uh, this is a question from Kendra Lee. What is the difference between being ace and extended periods of celibacy? Is being ace permanent? My sexuality has been very fluid throughout life. I feel like now I might be ace. 
So celibacy is the behavior. So you can be celibate and not have sex and still be allosexual and very much feel sexual attracting to people. You're just not acting on it. So that, that's kind of the answer to that. Like during extended periods of celibacy, if you still, you know, experience sexual attraction to others, that's usually not what we would term asexuality. But if there were extended periods where you feel like you didn't feel sexual attraction to others, then maybe that would be um, thought of as asexuality. Um, one thing that aces really say is that only you can decide for yourself whether you're asexual. We don't, we really don't try to diagnose other people. You know, people will come to me and be like, I think I'm ace, do you think I'm ace? And I'll be like, well, the best thing to do is just to read other people's experiences. Like, does that align with you? And really importantly, like, is it helpful for you, like, to understand the world in this way and think about yourself as asexual? But definitely, of course, I think people's as we talked about people's sexualities are fluid and people can go through periods of aceness, I think, and maybe periods of being less ace, I suppose. Abolish the phrase, it's just a phase. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Phases are good. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question from Kaj. Do you have advice on how to talk to a therapist about being ace when they may not be the most ace accepting? Hmm. That's a good question too. I think for me, I'm trying to think because I've been in therapy and strangely enough, my asexuality actually very rarely comes up in therapy for myself. I have other problems I need to work on. Um, I, I think the first thing is kind of preparing yourself for that conversation because I think it can be really devastating, especially with a therapist that you maybe you've grown to trust and like really care about and you believe sees you. I think you know, kind of stealing yourself for the worst, because if they respond in a way that's maybe a little bit dismissive, whether they mean to or not, then that can be really hurtful. So like preparing yourself for that. So you're not, you know, when you, when you're exposing yourself in that way, not making yourself too vulnerable. And I think, I think maybe showing them some TED talks or something about it might, might help. Like, I think that it's one thing that's really hard for ACEs. And part of the reason I wrote the book is because there's so much labor that goes into explaining what it is you know you say you're ace and then you have to be like some aces are like this and some are like this and it means that and it doesn't mean that so i think maybe if you can bring some resources for them um and have them and be like i'm ace and if you don't understand what that means here are some things that maybe you can read on your own time um, instead of spending your entire you know therapy session doing the ace 101 spiel to them so yeah i think a good thing to do is come be prepared like i don't think you should have to educate them but telling them where they can educate themselves and i think a good therapist that cares about you will take the time to educate themselves is there a specific ted talk that you'd recommend um not off the top of my head but i know there's a lot of ted talks about asexuality <clears throat> that makes sense mm -hmm. this is a question from socially divisive what is your opinion on the relationships between the ACE community and other LGBT identities? Oftentimes I've heard so much about the erasure and invalidation of other minorities towards ACE identities and the whole A is for ally instead of asexual. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the A is for ally. And this is a good question because it's something I've been thinking about a lot too. So I think I take it for granted that ACEs are queer or rather that ACEs can be considered queer if they want to. Now I know not everyone who's ACE does use that term. And because I took it for granted, if you look at the jacket copy on my book, you know, the promotional blurb will say something like exploring the A in LGBTQIA. And so I was kind of surprised when people kept asking me over and over, are aces queer? And they weren't asking in an attacking way or like trying to troll me or anything. It was like genuine interest. And I do think aces are queer because aces are not heterosexual. Even if you are a heteromantic ace, you experience compulsory sexuality and you are outside these heteronormative um, expectations of what you're supposed to be. And at the same time, I think a lot of heteromantic aces feel uncomfortable claiming asexuality because they do feel excluded. And there's these questions like, am I queer enough? Um, my struggle is not the same. I don't wanna take away resources. And I've spoken to a lot of ace political activists and it's always like, we're not trying to take away resources. You know, There are people, for example, trans youth who are probably at higher risk um, for um, danger, high risk of homelessness than ACE youth. It's not like we're trying to take those resources and divert them to us. Um, it's about coalition building and being part of the community and saying that we're outside of heteronormativity. Uh, so th that's how I feel. Like I don't think that there should be exclusion, though I think the reality is that often ACEs are excluded or erased or tokenized. You know, I think something that's very common is that 
organizations will have their one ACE event during ACE Awareness Week, which happens to be this week, and then never again when they talk about asexuality. And I'd like to see that change. Mm. Thank you for that answer. Um, this is a question from the audience. Do you have any plan to translate ACE to other languages? I grew up in Korea and I feel so validated reading your book. Even now, I think there's very little awareness of asexuality in many Asian countries, and I hope more people can have access to this wonderful and important book. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, and it's, it's, second of all, that is not within my power. <laughs> that is all about my publishers and stuff like that. But third of all, so when I sold the book, it was specifically for um, US, North America, and I think Europe. And in the author's note, it, it says like pretty specifically, like, this is about like the Western context, which doesn't mean white. There's plenty of non-white people in, you know, in the West, but I, I'm, I'm still thinking about how I feel about the book being translated. You know, if we got translators to translate other languages, of course, you know, I would say yes. Of course, I would love to see it, um, you know, be more widely read. But just thinking about it personally, I'm a little, I'm curious how it would be received because the cultural, um, the, the cultural framing is so different in Korea or in China where I'm from or in, you know, various parts of Africa. So like asexuality, I'm sure is differently experienced there because the cultures there are so different. So um, I hope there will be translations, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I hope the literature sort of like emerges um, mm -hmm. across the world. Okay, this is the actual last question. Okay. Um, I don't know who, oh, it's, it's a question from Ash. What advice would you give to someone who wants to become an advocate or activist for asexuality? Hmm. I think, and this is similar to what you and I were saying, Sabrina, I think the first part of it is just talking about it more. Um, you know, like talking about it with, with your friends and there's so many opportunities to do that. So for me um, personally, like, like again, like I don't know if I always feel comfortable talking about my own sexuality, like in some ways, like this position of advocate, even though it's one I obviously took on voluntarily because I voluntarily wrote the book. I don't know if it's necessarily aligned with just my personality, but for people who do want to do that kind of education, who very naturally are good at that, you know, go ahead and you, and have these conversations with people, not necessarily doing the ACE 101 spiel all the time, but bringing in the ACE perspective, you know, when your friends are talking about like a date they had and the guy was really pushy, you know, like, what, what can you bring there? And then there's a lot of like ACE discord groups. And then there's, I mean, there's asexual outreach. That's a group, like there's a lot of places online we can get involved in a lot of ACE activists. And I think ACE activists are really, really welcoming. So there's definitely places to do that on a more formal level. Amazing. Um, well, that was the final question. And I just wanted to thank you again, Angela, for your time, both in the care and thought that you put into this book and also into this conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. It was fun, good to see you again. And of course, thank you to everyone who came. I'm honored and delighted. Yeah, um, so I'm going to transition or I'm going to invite Alex back uh, to sort of finish out the event. But yeah, thank you audience for listening. Um, everyone should read Ace. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope you will join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded tonight. So if you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.